title of our lesson last Sunday morning was, Just Like Oil and Water, They Do Not Mix. You can do your best to try to get oil and water to mix, and guess what? You will never accomplish that. Folks, that is just a matter of science. As I was thinking about that idea, I thought, you know, there's a lot of other things that don't mix well. How about these? Snails and salt. Don't mix very well, do they? Not if you're the snail. Drinking and driving, we hear that constantly, don't we? Do not drink and drive, they just don't mix. Red Bull and milk, I've never tried it, don't plan to, but they say they don't mix. A lot of stomach problems. Bleach and ammonia, do not mix. Gator fans and Alabama fans, they just don't mix. I want to continue that thought this morning. Just like oil and water, they do not mix. You see, in the spiritual realm, there are a lot of things that do not mix well together whatsoever. We talked about two things in our last lesson. Let's talk about three more things in this lesson. Number one, love and hate do not mix. Folks, we cannot love something or someone and love that something or hate that something and someone at the same time. Now, we can make four applications of that particular thought in this lesson. First, you cannot love and hate God at the same time. The Bible plainly tells us that we are to love God. We turn over to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Our God desires our love to pour out on his behalf. And yet, it's impossible to love him and hate him at the same time. Jesus even makes that statement in Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Folks, we cannot love God and hate him at the same time. Secondly, we cannot love people and hate people at the same time. Jesus says in John 15, 17, And this commandment give I unto you, that ye love one another. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, that upon our obedience to the gospel, we should have fervent charity one for another. It's impossible for you to love me and to hate me at the same time. You see, it's either one or the other. Now, we do our best, don't we, when it comes to human relationships to escape that idea of one or the other. What we'll normally do is say something like this, Well, I don't hate him, but I don't like him. Ain't that something? Here's the question, where does the Bible ever put forth that kind of an idea? I don't hate him, but I sure don't like him. You see, it enables us to escape the commandment to love one another. Folks, the moment that an individual ceases truly loving, then that individual now has hatred in his heart for the other individual. Number three, you cannot love and hate evil or good at the same time. The Bible tells us to hate the evil and love the good. Amos 5 verse 15. 
Isn't that a difficult thing to do sometimes in our society? To hate the evil? In fact, in our society today, we are being pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed to love things that are evil. To accept them, to tolerate them, and if you don't, then you are definitely going to be called all kinds of names. You're going to be put in all kinds of categories, and you're going to be castigated as if you are some wicked person just because you hate the evil and love the good. But my friends, the very moment that I change that perspective, the very moment that I begin to love the evil is the very moment that I also begin to hate what is good. You see, you can't do both at the same time. How about this next one? This is another hard one for us. The things of this world. The Bible says for us not to love the things of the world. For if any man love the things of this world, guess what? The love of the Father is not in him, John says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What are some of the things of the world? Well, Jesus talks about those in the parable of the sower, doesn't he? He talks about that individual whose heart gets overtaken by the thorns of this world. And he says that the thorns of this world involve such things as the cares, the riches, and the pleasures of this life. How often do you and I have to make decisions about spiritual things versus worldly things? Am I going to do the spiritual thing or am I going to do the worldly thing? Am I going to show God that I truly love Him or am I going to allow my desire to participate in worldly things to overcome that love? Folks, the very moment that I select the things of the world over the Father, I cease loving God according to the Scripture. You cannot love and you cannot hate at the same time. It's an impossibility. Point number two. Unity and division are like oil and water. They just don't mix. Let's talk about unity for just a minute. Unity is an easily defined concept as far as Scripture is concerned. Because you see, it defines it as oneness, doesn't it? Jesus said in John 17, 20 and 21, Neither pray I for these alone, before them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they also may be one. Folks, God wants all of His followers to be one. Now what does that look like? What does that mean when we say one? Kathleen and I, we love to ride our beach cruisers. And when you look at that bike, guess what? You just see one thing, don't you? If I were to ask anybody, what is that? Everybody would say, it's a bike. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? There's wheels, spokes, pedals. There's a frame. There's a seat. There's handlebars. There's grips that are there. We have to have our little drink holder. Got to have our little bell to warn people that we're coming. Kathleen's got a little basket up there. It's a lot of different parts, but guess what? That bike works as one, doesn't it? And when we refer to it, we don't refer to it, oh, that's just a bunch of bike parts put together. No, we say there's a bike. It is one single unit as we look at it. And my friends, that is exactly the way God wants His followers to be. I want us to be one. Not divided. Now the standard for unity, this is what amazes me, is extremely high. Notice what Jesus says. He says that it is like unto the Godhead. It is supposed to be like the unity that exists between the Father and the Son. That they all may be one, listen to Him, as Thou, Father, art in me and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us. 
Can you imagine that? God wants us in this audience at Oceanside to be united in such a way that we resemble the unity that exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How much division exists between the three members of the Godhead? Absolutely none. They think alike. They speak alike. They have the same desires, the same ambition, the same will. There is absolutely nothing among them whatsoever that divides them. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. John 17 Verse 20. Jesus said that when you see me, you see who? You see the Father. You see, the standard of unity is extremely high, isn't it? And you see, division, folks, runs contrary to unity. Have you ever looked up the definition of division? Very simply, it's defined as this the act of separating into parts. We live in a society today that is bound and determined to separate us as much as can possibly be done. Did you know that? It's amazing, is it not? It's frustrating to me, especially as a preacher. You're trying to promote unity. You're trying to promote individuals coming together. And the minute you step outside this building... Everything in the world is trying to divide us and make us hate one another as much as we possibly can. I looked up some of the synonyms for division. Watch this. Divorce. Rupture. Severance. How do you like this last one? Dismemberment. Boy, that one sounds good, doesn't it? I don't know, I kind of like my body, don't you? And I don't want anybody dismembering me. I like it functioning as one solid single unit, don't you? But watch this next word, folks. Disunion. Division is exactly the opposite of unity. Now we have an example in Scripture of division and it's found in the church at Corinth. In this morning's lesson we quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. But Paul goes on in the next two verses to talk about the division that was there because it was an awful division. Notice what he says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Another word for what? Divisions. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. A divided congregation, weren't they? They were divided over who had baptized which individuals in that congregation. My baptism is better than yours because Paul baptized me. Well, I don't care. It was Jesus who baptized me. Well, I'm not worried about that because it was Apollos. And you know Apollos. He's well versed in Scripture who baptized me. So you had the Apollosites, Cephasites, all divided through the congregation of Corinth. Churches can either have unity or they can have division. But guess what? They cannot have both. A church cannot be divided and unified at the same time. Now, I realize that there are some individuals who love to contend for something known as unity in diversity. This is a big concept even in the denominational world, isn't it? Unity and diversity. One man defined unity and diversity as tying two cat's tails together and throwing them over a clothesline. He said, you got union, but you sure don't have any unity, do you? Folks, unity and diversity is fine as this. Going along to get along. That's all it is. 
we disagree, we don't have union, we don't have true unity, but we're just going to get along with each other. You see, what happens is this, we're going to overlook all of our differences except maybe one or two little key ingredients. You see, in the world today, as long as you acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, people will say you're a Christian, won't they? And they will accept you, embrace you, and love you, and it doesn't matter what else you believe, just as long as you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Folks, it is a pseudo-unity. That little word pseudo means nothing more than false. It's a false unity. If we're going to be united, we all have to be saying the same thing. There can be no divisions among us. We're to be perfectly joined together according to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Folks, unity and diversity doesn't meet the standard of biblical unity, does it? It does not meet the standard of unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congregations need to do everything they possibly can to work toward true unity of believers in those congregations. It's not easy to do. That's why Paul says we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4 verse 3. It's something that we have to constantly be working at. But if we're not unified, we're divided. This last point is one that is really beautiful to me. We'll spend just a little bit of time on it. Folks, the minute, the minute sin is present in our lives, purity ceases to exist. Is that a pretty bold statement? kind of troubling, isn't it? You say, oh, now preacher, come on. You ever gone to a restaurant, ask for a napkin, and they give you one that's got a spot on it? I have. I need a napkin. I need to wipe, wipe my face. I need to wipe my hands. I looked at that napkin, and there's a little smudge of something on it. Oh, yeah, that's the one I want. Are you kidding me? Folks, that's the one you wad up and you throw away immediately, don't you? Or you may, if they bring you like a napkin or something, you immediately call the waiter over and say, Hey dude, look at this thing. This thing is nasty. Get me a clean one. And all it takes is just one little smudge, isn't it? Ceases to be pure. We'll leave the church building today and... Oftentimes I have to come back up front and take care of all my stuff. And as I do, I kind of walk through the building. I look down the aisles to see if there's stuff that's been dropped, stuff that's there. And guess what it takes? Just one little piece of paper. And you go, oh, look at there. So guess what you do? You run over there and pick it up because you want things to be what? You want things to be clean. You want things to be presentable. You don't want your neighbors to come in the building and little pieces of trash laying all over everything. The building's not clean with just a little piece of paper on the floor. I like my car to get washed too. Kathleen says I'm getting old. I don't like it as much as I used to. But have you ever gone and got your car washed and you come back home and you're looking around your car and all of a sudden you look and there's one water spot? Oh, are you kidding me? I'm worn out. I'm tired. I spent an hour on this crazy car. And one water spot. You know what I don't do? I don't just forget it. Man, no. You go get you a little damp rag and go get you another dry rag. Work yourself to death to get the water spot out of it. Why? Because one little spot ruins purity, folks. Just a little bit of sin in our lives ruins our purity. Now the Bible exhorts us not to sin. Do you know that? 
Paul says in Romans 6 verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now listen to him, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Don't sin. When John wrote his first letter in 1 John 2 verse 1, he says this, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. I don't want you to sin. Same letter, 1 John 3 verse 9, tells us that he that is born of God doth not commit sin. Man, is that a pretty high standard? Yeah. Yeah. Because you see, the moment we sin, guess what happens? There is a stain on our soul, isn't there? That's a tough one for Christians. Let me put it this way. That's a tough one for Victor. Because I know that I commit sin, don't you? The Bible tells us if we say we have no sin, what? We deceive ourselves. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10 tells us this. If we say we have no sin, we make Him a what? We make Him a liar, folks. Every one of us, even as God's children, what? Sin. And the minute you sin, you're defiled. You're like that old napkin with that little bitty stain on it. But watch this. As faithful Christians, underline the word faithful, okay? As faithful Christians, though, the Bible tells us if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse 7. You see, we're no longer living a life of sin. We are no longer walking the direction of sin. Oh yes, we sin occasionally. Yes, sometimes Satan wins the battle and we yield to temptation. But it is not... A habitual way of life. You and I are striving every day to walk in righteousness, are we not? And folks, as long as we are striving to walk in righteousness, guess what? We have the blood of Jesus at our disposal. And John goes on in that same chapter and says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9. Yes, I sin. Yes, I mess up. Yes, I've committed a trespass against God. But guess what I can do? I can bow my head and I can ask God to forgive me. And guess what? The blood of Jesus cleanses me of my iniquity. And folks, I have an advocate at that point. And that advocate is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Think about that. You sin, you know you've sinned, you confess that sin, having repented of it, and then our Lord and Savior goes before God and He says, God, cleanse that man's sin. Take away all of his iniquities. Why? Because I have died for him and my blood has cleansed him from all iniquity. You look at him as if he is justified. In fact, he is justified in the name of God. Of Jesus Christ. Boy, isn't that a wonderful thought? Some of us might keep Jesus a little more busy in court than others. But folks, that's what He's there for, is He not? To be an advocate on our behalf. Now watch this. Jesus' blood enables us to stand before God, and I want you to underline that word, completely stain free from sin. I love this right here. You know it? Let me ask you something. How much sin is going to get into heaven? Not an ounce. Not a drop. Not a smidgen. I guess a smidgen is less than a drop. None, folks. That place is totally, completely pure, holy, and undefiled. Now if you and I are going to get there, guess what? You and I somehow have to be totally, completely spot-free, don't we? 
Can that happen? Oh yes, listen. Paul told the church at Corinth, that I may present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Wow. A chaste virgin unto Christ. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1 verse 4, he says this, that we should be holy and without what? Blame before Him in love. Note that. I'm holy and I'm without blame. He has absolutely nothing He can blame me for. Not one trespass, not one sin, not one transgression. In that same book, Paul writes about the church and he says this, that he might present it, the church, unto himself. A glorious church, not having what? Spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Can you imagine? You and I can stand right in the presence of the Almighty God. And when He looks at us, He sees no sin at all. None. It's amazing to me. How about this next verse? Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in Him in peace, without spot, what? And blameless. Jude writes in his letter the following, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you what? Faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Folks, our God has the ability through the blood of Jesus to cleanse every spot from our soul. And when we stand before God, guess what he sees? He sees absolute perfection. Isn't that amazing? And the reason it amazes me is because of how imperfect I am. That's why it amazes me. You see, God can see every sin, can He? doesn't matter how little it is, and it doesn't matter where it's hidden. It can be in the most remote recesses of my heart. Way back in the caves and caverns and covered up with all the rocks that I could possibly put there. But guess what? If it's there, God knows it. But in the last day, cleansed by Jesus' blood, I stand in the presence of a holy God. Faultless. Without spot without wrinkle, and without anything to blame me for at all. Not because of what I've done, but because of the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. What a blessing, folks. What a blessing. Just like oil and water, there's something in the spiritual realm that just don't mix, folks. Love and hate don't mix. You can't love me and hate me at the same time. It's an impossibility. Number two, unity and division. Can't mix. We're either unified or what? We are divided. Do you think the Lord can see our divisions? Oh yes, He can see them. Sin and purity cannot mix. Here's what you and I need to comprehend folks if they don't mix then we need to quit trying to do it you know what and we need to start doing the thing that God wants us to do don't we if love and hate don't mix then what does God want me to do he wants me to love well let's start loving then if unity and division don't mix what does God want he wants unity well let's start working toward unity then if sin and purity don't mix, what does God want? He wants purity. Well, let's start working toward purity then. Here's a wonderful thought. Detergent can be added to water in order to cleanse our clothes. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Aren't you glad that detergent and water don't mix? Aren't you glad they do mix? Because you see, it's the only way what? It's the only way to get our clothes clean, is it not? 
You can add that detergent, wash them a little bit, bring them out. And you go, wow, look here, I can wear this thing again. Here's the point, folks, in like manner. The blood of Jesus can mix with my sinful life. And guess what it can do? It can purify and make my life and my soul spot-free, can it? Go back sometime. Do a study of the church at Corinth. One of the most wicked churches that existed in the first century. All kinds of sin, all kinds of division, all kinds of iniquity. When Paul writes them in 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 9, he just starts listing about eight or ten sins in which they had been engaged in times past, and they were some awful people. But guess what? Paul said, And such were some of you, but ye are what? Washed. Here was a group of individuals who were just as filthy as they can be. The Lord washed them in His blood and they came out sanctified, holy, <clears throat> useful unto God on the other side. Why? Because they were washed in His blood. My friends, if you're not washed, you're not useful to our Lord right now. But you can be. The question is, how do we touch the cleansing blood of Jesus? In order to do that, I have to come in contact with His death, don't I? Because it's in His death that He shed His blood. I believe in Jesus as the Christ. I repent of sins. I die to that old way of living. I confess His name, but I still have yet to touch the blood of Jesus. That's done in the waters of baptism. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ? We're baptized, listen to Him, into His death. Wow, it's in His death that we are baptized. Folks, when you and I are baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, we touch the blood of Jesus, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, and we arise out of those waters a new creature, cleansed, pure, holy, stained free from all of our transgressions. Do you need to do that this morning? We pray that you will. Maybe you're an erring child of God and for some reason, You've gone back out there into the world and your soul is stained. But you want to walk in the light, folks. Confess your sin. Ask God to forgive you of that. And you'll have Jesus stand in the court of God, pleading on your behalf for your forgiveness. If you need to do that this morning, won't you come as we stand and sing?